Amen. Praise the Lord. If you'd like to take your seats. Thank you, team. We are going to continue our study of the book of Revelation. Um, now, last time we finished chapter 8, and we have started to look at the seven trumpets. Uh, if you can remember, we got to the fourth trumpet, and then there is a division between the first four and the last three. This is a pattern you find throughout Scripture. We might look at that in a moment. Uh, you'll find that there's always, when you find a number seven, when you find a pattern or distinction of the sevens, you will notice that there is often what's called this Hebraic way of splitting the seven between a three and a four. We'll look at that in a moment. It's probably easier to understand by looking at examples. It's a Hebraic way of writing. Uh, can we put up the first uh, slide, please? So we looked at this last time uh, in chapter 8. You'll remember we looked at the first trumpet, how the uh, earth is going to be scorched. Then we looked at the second trumpet, how there's going to be this explosion, this something like a huge mountain thrown into the sea uh, that destroys sea life. Then we looked at the third trumpet, how the fresh waters are going to be poisoned. And then we looked at the fourth trumpet, how uh, the atmospheric conditions change. Um, there's so much stuff in the atmosphere that the sun can't shine properly. And we looked at the uh, we looked at the system of the thirds, a third of all these things being destroyed, and we looked at a little bit of what that third means. And then when, uh, when we got to the end there of uh, chapter 8, if we can go to chapter 8 and verse 12, we find something called the three woes. As I watched, I heard an angel that was flying in mid-air call out in a loud voice, woe, 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 to the inhabitants of the earth, because of the trumpet blasts about to be sounded by the other three angels. And so what we've seen here is we've seen four trumpets being sounded, really bad things happening. But then we find an angel in midair saying, whoa, 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 because of what's going to happen to the final three trumpets. The first four is not going to be anywhere near as bad as the last three. Um, as I said, this is, a, this is a Hebrew construct. You find it throughout the Bible, three and then four, or four and then three. If you remember, we looked at it when we looked at the seven churches in Revelation. Three churches were different, four were different to the three. There was three that would pass away, there was four that would be assessed at the second coming of Jesus Christ. Without going over that, we looked at that again. If you go to Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 18... Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 18. Just let us to get a little bit of understanding of why there's a split between the three and the four. There are three things that are too amazing for me, four that I do not understand. An eagle in the sky. What have we just seen? An eagle in the sky. What does that mean? I don't know, neither did he. The writer of the Proverbs didn't know what it meant. He, that's what he's saying. There's these three things and then four things. I don't understand. The way of an eagle in the sky, the way of a snake on a rock, the way of a ship on the high seas, the way of a man with a young woman is the fourth thing. So he's there revealing the mysteries to us. The way of an eagle in the sky, you know, what does that mean? Christians are supposed to soar like eagles in the sky. How do we overcome this world? Don't know, but we do. The way of the snake on a rock, how does Satan attack the church? Don't know, but the snake does get on the rock, but the snake can't harm the rock. Satan is obviously the snake, the rock is the church, the church which was built, built on the rock, Jesus said. A way of a ship on the seas, the church is always portrayed as a ship in the sea. How come the ship doesn't sink? How come the sea never overcomes the ship? Don't know, but it doesn't. And then the way of a man with a young woman or the way of a man with a virgin, a maiden. How is the relationship? This is the fourth. There's three and then four. The fourth is the most mysterious of all. The bride of Christ. Christ taking his bride. What, how do we understand that? We don't. So we've got to understand that when you see these three things and four things, it's trying to show us that there's a mystery involved in understanding these things. And you'll never fully understand it, but you'll understand the typology and you'll understand 
um, that the Bible does give us illumination on those things. You find it throughout the Bible. You find it, the prophets used it quite a lot. If you go to Amos 2 and um, verse 1, Amos chapter 2 and verse 1, when he's declaring woe onto things, when he's declaring judgment on things, he uses the same formula, uh, this three and four formula, making a, a, a total of seven completion. For this is what the Lord says, for three sins of Moab, even for four, I will not relent. Because he burned to ashes the bones of Edom's king, I will send fire on Moab that will consume the fortresses of Kirioth. That's where Judas Iscariot was from, by the way. Iscariot means from Kirioth. Moab will go down in great tumult amid war cries and the blast of the trumpet. So what have you got? You've got the prophet here declaring something, not just about Moab, but a way that God works. Three, four, fire, trumpet. Yeah? This is exactly what we've just seen in Revelation chapter 8. Three, four, trumpet, fire. Yeah? The prophet's showing us a pattern in the way that God will work. I will destroy her ruler, kill all her, all her officials with him, says the Lord. Amos is uh, very helpful in understanding the, the, uh, the patterns in Revelation. We might come back to Amos later. He's one of the prophets who not only prophesied of his day. Remember when a prophet prophesies something, it was, it is, and it is to come. It's always a pattern. It's not just prediction and fulfillment, okay? So we've got these patterns there, the three and the seven. Remember, we looked at the seven deacons. Three of them we know a lot about. Four of them we don't know much about. The pattern of the three and the four making up seven. It's all the way uh, through Scripture. Now, whilst we're in Amos, if you remember last time, Amos 5 and verse 7, um, if we go to the King James for this one, Amos 5 and verse 7, you remember we actually read this at the end of uh, the last study. So this prophet who's just said the three and the four, the fire and the trumpets, is a sign of God's judgment. Um, he's the one who said, you turned judgment to wormwood. Remember the, the trumpet we've just heard was a star, wormwood, that brought bitterness and death to the earth. And... He's using exactly the same terminology. Seek him that makes the seven stars. He's using the same words that John uses in Revelation. The reason I want us to see this is because we're going to come back to Amos uh, in a few minutes because uh, he helps us understand something very important. And without Amos, we, we might not fully understand this. So he's already said these things, judgment, fire, trumpets, wormwood, seven stars, seek the seven stars before God brings this destruction. Okay, so what John's seen in Revelation is the things, some of the things that Amos has already prophesied in the Old Testament. Judgment coming on people's sins. Three was bad, four's even worse. You know, we've had the four trumpets, now we're going into what's even worse. We've got, we're going to what's called the three woes. Okay, so we're going to look at the three woes. Just in summary of all chapter 9, because we'll not get through all chapter 9 tonight, um, basically what we're going to be looking at in chapter 9 is cosmic conflict. Okay, I think that's the best way I can describe it. We're talking about warfare on a massive scale. There's going to be warfare on earth, there's going to be warfare in the heavenlies, there's going to be angelic warfare, there's going to be a mighty battle that's been predicted from the beginning of time. All the prophets spoke about these battles. We have lots of different names for them. We might look at some of those tonight. But basically, we're going to see descriptions of what are going to happen, these wars, uh, in this spiritual conflict. Now, let me just say this to help us understand something. Are you all still with me? Good. Is Revelation in chronicle, chronological order? Well, the answer is... Yes, sort of. Okay? Um, it's not actually possible to tell a story in absolute chronological order chronological order because you have to fill in narrative describing what's happening, otherwise it won't make sense. So generally speaking, yes, Revelation is in chronological order. 
but you'll start to see descriptions of certain characters in Revelation. We're going to see one tonight. You'll see a big one in Revelation 13 where it describes Antichrist, the beast. But remember, he already came at the opening of the seals. He was the rider on the white horse. So when the beast appears in chapter 13, it's not a different beast. It's just giving more information about him. He actually came riding as the false messiah um, when the seals were opened, the opening of the, the first seal, the rider on the white horse, that we looked at at the opening of the seven seals. And it's the same with the wars. You remember the rider on the red horse would bring war to earth. So wars are going to happen. Now we're going to be looking at some of those wars tonight. Some people try and lump it all into one big battle, and I do think there is going to be one big battle, but there are also lots of battles that are all part of the same war. It's the same conflict that's going on. So it overlaps a little bit with some of the things we've already looked at, and it will continue until the end of Revelation, till Jesus comes and he, and he brings an end in the final battle. Um, but we're going to look at a specific battle tonight, and it does overlap. It could have started way back in the seals. Because when you think about wars, the strange things, aren't there? When does a war start? Yeah. Does anybody know when World War II started? When did World War II start? 3rd of September 1979. But you fell into my trap. Because it wasn't a world war. It was the start of Britain and France against Germany. But that wasn't the start of the world war. The world war didn't start until the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor two years later. And then the conflict became a world conflict. Now, we call it World War II when it started with Germany, but it actually wasn't World War II at that point. It was a European conflict. Do you see what I mean? So how long did it last? Six, seven years. But at the time, you wouldn't have called it World War II until probably 1942. You know, as I always remind our American cousins, you know, you did help us in the war, but you waited till we were winning before you decided to come and help us. You didn't join us uh, originally, you know, waited a couple of years. So um, we're still glad they came and helped us. So when we're looking at these conflicts, there's overlaps. When is the Battle of Armageddon? When is this big conflict that we call the Battle of Gog and Magog? Because there's different stages in this conflict. And so there is overlaps. So don't try and tie everything down absolutely specifically because the terminology uh, can be spread over a chronological period and, and it's the same with antichrist when does he come well he comes at the beginning the rider on the white horse we've seen that but you'll find he also comes uh, here in chapter 9 he also comes in chapter 13 but he's not he's not coming in a sense of appearing is coming in the sense of a new revelation of who he is. It's like, when did Jesus come? When he was born in Bethlehem. Yeah, but no one knew, did they? Uh, did he come when he stood up and preached in Galilee? Did he come when he entered Jerusalem on a donkey? That is actually the date that he presented himself as Messiah. That was 33 years after he'd actually come. He came, if you know what I mean. And so, you know, we can sometimes fall into the trap of trying to be too specific over a general period. It's, uh, it's Israel's 70th anniversary um, this coming week, coming two weeks. But actually, when did Israel become a nation? Because the UN resolution was in 1947, not 1948. And the British said the Jews could come home in 1917 not 1948. So it's over a period. The state of Israel proper was born in 1948, but it was happening before that. So we understand there's a, a, there's a time frame, a chronological period to put these things, but sometimes you can't be absolutely specific time-wise because it's spread over a period. These wars, I mean, when, is, when did Israel um, enter into war with its neighbors? Well, it's never stopped really, has it? I mean, it fought for its life the day it was established in 1948, and it's still on a war footing. Even tonight, they've recalled the planes from an exercise because they expect conflict today, 70 years later. So it's, you know, it's, it's an ongoing thing, but the specific events that we can look at along that time frame. So Revelation is in order, sort of, but there's bits of narrative we have to catch up along the way. So... 
having understood that, let's go to Revelation chapter 9 and verse 1. So what I'll do is I'll read um, until I find a place to stop and then we'll break it down into manageable components to look at because when you read this next section, it, it sounds really weird. Sounds very strange, but we'll break it down into its components. We'll look at it. We'll analyze it according to Scripture so that we'll get an understanding of what's really happening here. Okay. The fifth angel sounded his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. The star was given the key to the shaft of the abyss. When, when he opened the abyss... Smoke rose from it like the smoke from a gigantic furnace. The sun and sky were darkened by the smoke from the abyss. And out of the smoke, locusts came down on the earth and were given power like that of scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any plant or tree, but only those people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were not allowed to kill them, but only to torture them for five months. And the agony they suffered was like that of the sting of a scorpion when it strikes. During those days, people will seek death, but will not find it. They will long to die, but death will elude them. The locust looked like horses prepared for battle. On their heads, they wore something like crowns of gold, and their faces resembled human faces. Their hair was like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the thundering of many horses and chariots rushing into battle. They had tails with stings like scorpions, and in their tails they had power to torment people for five months. They had as king over them the angel of the abyss, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek is Apollyon, that is, the destroyer. The first woe is past, two other woes are yet to come, and then we get to the sixth angel sounding his trumpet, we'll look at that later maybe not even tonight. So a lot of information in there in those first 12 verses of chapter 9. So what on earth is going on there? Locusts, angels, stars, abyss, lots of metaphors using to describe lots of different aspects of lots of different things. Um, and some people go into all kinds of weird terminology to try and describe what's going on there. I'm just going to try and stick to what the Bible says. I'm not going to try anything weird. I'm just going to stick to what the Bible says these things are. Okay, so let's go to verse 1. Let's start at verse 1. Chapter 9 and verse 1. So the fifth angel sounds his trumpet. We know what the angels are, the seven angels that come out of God's presence. We know what the trumpets are. They're the judgments of God coming on the earth because of man's sin. We've already looked at that. And then I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. Notice the past tense here. He's not seeing the star fall. He saw a star that had already fallen. There is already a fallen star that fell from heaven to earth. What are the stars in Revelation? Angels, angelic beings, or heavenly hosts, or the sons of God, the stars. It you know, includes cherubim as well. It's these heavenly bodies. He sees this star that had already fallen. He didn't see it fall. But someone saw it fall. Jesus. What did Jesus say? I saw Satan fall from heaven to earth as lightning. You will tread on snakes and scorpions. Nothing will by any means hurt you. Right? He reminded them not to be afraid of demons. You cast them out. They can't hurt you. Jesus says, I saw him fall. John didn't see him fall, but he saw the star that had already fallen. So he's seeing a fallen star. Now, is this Satan? Well, I don't know who else it is. If we look at Isaiah 14 and verse 12, 
How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to earth, you who once laid low the nations. And then he describes, you know, the aspects of Satan. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God, the angels of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of the assembly. I will on the utmost heights of the Mount Zaphon, which actually means the sides of the north, coming from the north in, in Hebrew, uh, Mount Zaphon. I will ascend amongst the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. So here's a description of what Satan tried to do, but Jesus says he fell. Isaiah says he fell. John says he sees this fallen star. You've fallen from heaven, this star and you've been cast down to the earth. You wanted to be above the stars, but now you're the star that's been cast to earth. So I deduce that the star that has fallen to earth in chapter 9 is Satan. If you think differently, God bless you. But as far as I can understand from the Bible, he's the one. Okay? He's the fallen star. So he falls to earth. He's on earth. So if we go back to Revelation chapter 9 and verse 1. What does he do? He's already fallen to earth. The star, the star that's fallen to earth, was given the key to the shaft of the abyss. Right? Now, he didn't have this key. He gets it now. He's given the key to the shaft of the abyss. What is the abyss? This shaft, this place... Um, what is it? Because Satan now has the key to this. It's interesting, when Jesus conquered Satan, he took the keys. Right? But now, now Jesus has removed the church and removed his people. He gives Satan the keys back. Why does he do that? You'll have to ask him. I don't know. He does. Why does he do all the things he does in Revelation? Because he's consummating everything to fulfill his final purposes. So Satan is given the key to the shaft of the abyss. What is the abyss? Well, we get some clues from what Jesus told us, um, or what's mentioned in the Gospels about the abyss. If we go to Luke chapter 8 and verse 30, Luke chapter 8 and verse 30, you remember when Jesus cast out demons, what did demons say? Jesus asked the demons, or the man who got the demons, what is your name? Legion, he replied, because many demons had gone into him. And they begged Jesus repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. Yeah? So the abyss is the place that demons are put. Yeah? The demons don't want to go there, but they know they are going there. And so or some demons are there. So the abyss is this place where demons are kept, not just demons. Now, we've got to understand something. Abyss is a, a, a buios, a busos, is a Greek word. It literally means bottomless pit. Uh, in Greek mythology, it was the lowest part of all creation. It was far below Hades as heaven is above earth. It was considered the worst place. The, the dungeons of darkness, this literally called a bottomless pit, even in the scripture. Um, where is it? If a pit's under the earth and it doesn't have a bottom, it has to be at the center of the earth because that's the only place where everywhere is up from any point. So we've got this picture of this abyss. Now we're given more information about it. In 2 Peter chapter 2, we'll just start reading there from verse 4. For if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, which is Hades, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment. And then God goes on to describe how his judgments work. So the angels that sinned before the flood were put into this dungeon under the earth. This Hades, the, the abyss, this, this place. And then the flood happened. According to Greek understanding, the abyss is covered with water. In fact, when Jesus went to Caesarea Philippi and he went to the gates of hell, some of us have been to the gates of hell at, uh, at Banyas, Caesarea Philippi, at the foot of Mount Hermon, and it's a huge cave, and it was originally covered in water. And, and that's because demons, water seems to be the seal, the symbolic seal 
of the abyss where the demons and the fallen angels can't come from. Now, it's obviously more complicated than that, but that's, that seems to be a seal. That's why uh, demons don't like water. That's why the pigs run into the water to get rid of the demons. Jesus says when a demon is cast out, he goes into waterless places because it's a symbol of the seal of the abyss. And so after the flood came, it sealed this pit, this bottomless pit, this dungeons of darkness, this prison of Hades, this abyss. So we've got the demons there. We've got the fallen angels imprisoned under there. Now, if you read extra biblical information, the rabbinical literature around at the time, they're in full agreement with this. You read things like the book of Enoch, the book of Jasher, they say, yeah, the fallen angels and most of the demons were put in the abyss until the time of the end, uh, when they'll be released. They also say that the spirits of the Nephilim were put there as well. Um, but they, they say not all of them which is interesting. They say there's still some demons around, which we've just read. Jesus cast some demons out, and they says, are you going to put us in the abyss? But he didn't. Um, so it would appear most of the demons and, and, and all of the fallen angels are in the abyss, except Satan himself, who's a fallen cherub. Um, but there are still some around. So this is what this abyss is. What happens here in chapter 9 is Satan is given the keys to open it all up again. And he is given the keys to let everything out. Everything that caused destruction on earth in the first place, that God, that God had to cover with the flood, put them in the abyss, cover with the flood in the days of Noah. In Revelation chapter 9, they're all let out again. Now you think earth's bad now, with all the demonic spirits and evil around. What is it going to be like when they're all let out, because we only see a tiny fraction of them. There's no fallen angels running around today. They're in the abyss. They're going to be let out. When they were let out, when they came down the first time, they destroyed mankind very quickly. Uh, they, they created havoc and wars and things so bad. Even God said, I wish I'd not created mankind. It became so bad. So what we find here in Revelation chapter 9 is they're all going to be let out. So what happens in chapter 9 is you've got three things all coming together all at the same time. You have Satan himself, the fallen star who's there. You have the fallen angels all coming out of the abyss. And you have man's evil system, system running the planet. Now can you remember what we, we've kept stressing uh, throughout this study? God's three main problems. Can we just put up a sl that slide again, please, Luke, just to remind people. Remember, God has suffered three rebellions. Satan rebelled. The angels rebelled, some of them, a third of them. I don't know the exact number. And then man's system of Babylon rebels. Now, if you remember, what we said is God is going to bring all these three rebellions together at the same time on earth. He's going to let Satan have his power. He's going to release the fallen angels. And he's going to let mankind have what mankind has always wanted, basically to worship the devil. Man doesn't think that's what he's doing. But, but when you're worshiping yourself, that's what you're doing. Because that is the essence of self-worship. Satan's pride. And so man thinks he's his own saviour, sets up the system of Babylon. So the three problems that happened in the beginning of Genesis, God is now going to bring all together, all three of them together, in Revelation. We've just seen there, Revelation chapter 9, 11, the angels coming out of the abyss. Uh, Satan, obviously, is there in chapter 12 in great description. God is going to bind Satan. By the way, at the beginning of the millennium, Jesus binds Satan and puts him, it puts him in the abyss. That's why there is a thousand years of peace, because Satan himself is put in the abyss. Satan is not in the abyss. We tend to use that terminology of saying, you know, Satan is from the pit of hell. Satan is not in hell. Satan is the ruler of the principalities of the powers of the air. He's the king, he's the king of this world. He's not in hell. He's going to be bound and put into the abyss. Then he's going to be let out again at the end of the millennium. God's going to prove once and all for all to mankind 
what true righteousness and peace is. But that's a long way ahead. Uh, so we're not going to look at that. But he's going to bring these three problems. Remember, rebellion is always evil. Satan rebelled, the angels rebelled, mankind rebelled. So God is going to give the three rebels, the three different types of rebellion, he's going to give them what they want. Right? Be, always understand, God tends to give you what you want. That's why it's, it, you need to be very sure when you're telling God what to do. Because you might get what you want. And you might find out you don't know how to handle it. And it can destroy you. And so God's going to let all these three things come together. And that rebellion then is going to unleash his judgment on it. And he's going to show what rebellion will really bring. He's going to reveal what will happen on earth when these three things are given the power they crave. Oh, you want power over the world? Okay, you can have it. You want man's system of control, Babylon? Okay, you can have it. You want all these false religions and idols, these angels? Remember, the angels taught them all kinds of things. According to the, the, the information we have, the angels taught them technology and all kinds of things to enhance mankind's belief that man can save himself. And man still worships that ideal today. Secular humanism. We know what to do. Just give us enough money and we can save the planet. No, you can have as much money as you want. You'll still destroy the planet. Only God can bring about the fulfillment of righteousness. So these three things are going to come together. Here we start to see this happening now in Revelation chapter 9. Okay, so let's go to chapter 9 again. Chapter 9, verse 1 and 2. So when he opens the abyss... Smoke rose from it like the smoke from a gigantic furnace. The sun and sky were darkened by the smoke from the abyss. Remember, everything Satan does produces darkness. How do you know it's God? Because God's words always produce light. God's words always bring illumination. The entrance of your words bringeth light. The Bible tells us. Jesus says, my words are life. Jesus came as the light. He gives us the light. When Satan does something, it always produces darkness. You're always less clear about what's happening than you were before. That's how Satan operates. So he opens the abyss. Smoke rises. It rises like smoke from a gigantic furnace. The sun and the sky were darkened by the smoke from the abyss. And out of the smoke, locusts came down on the earth and were given power like that of scorpions of the earth they were told not to harm the grass or of the earth or any plant or tree but only those people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads okay let's stop there verse 3 says what comes out of the abyss fallen angels no nope. demons no nope. spirits of the Nephilim no nope. locusts why locusts are these really locusts? Well, when it gives us the description of what these locusts are like, as we've just read, they aren't locusts. Okay, God's using a metaphor of the locust. This, there's a very specific reason why God uses the metaphor of locusts. Can we put up the next slide, please? Just bring the first one down. All throughout the Bible... Locusts are symbols of certain things, very specific symbols. Now, one of the first things you need to understand about locusts is locusts were a judgment on Egypt. They were one of the plagues of Egypt. Yeah, you remember all the plagues on Egypt? Can you name them all? You will notice that all the plagues in Egypt, the plagues in Egypt, are all repeated in Revelation. You've noticed that. What was the first plague? The waters turned to blood. What have we just seen? The waters turned to blood. Yeah? Locusts is one of the plagues. Frogs is one of the plagues. In Revelation, you will find demons that look like frogs turn up. Boils is one of the plagues. You will find that those who take the mark of the beast, boils come upon them. Darkness is one of the plagues. We've just seen darkness is going to cover the skies. Hail is one of the plagues. What did we see with the trumpet judgments? Hail came down. So you see all these judgments, you know, Locusts is one of the judgments that God put the plague on Egypt. So the first thing we want to understand is that locusts are a picture of this judgment on the world. God is sending these locust-type things as part of the judgment. Now remember what Egypt had said 
to Moses. Moses said, let my people go. Let the Israelites go. Live in their own land. What did he, the Pharaoh of Egypt say? No. He hardened his heart. He says, who's God? I don't have to obey God. So Moses says, okay, locusts are coming. Now God is saying the same thing to the rulers of the earth. Okay, you say there's no God. You say you don't have to obey God. You say you're not going to let Egypt... Uh, Israel live in peace. You're not going to let them have their own land. You want to treat them as slaves. Okay, I'm going to send you locusts. Worse than the locusts in Egypt. Okay, now how do we know they're not real locusts? Well, they don't eat anything green. We've just read in Revelation. They didn't eat any green thing. Now, all locusts do is eat green things. These locusts that come in Revelation torment men. Now, there's only one thing that torments men. That's demons. These locusts are pictures of demons. And we'll see why as we look through uh, in a little bit more detail. It's something you need to understand. Locusts are always that picture. If we go to the next one. So, as we've just said, um, they can't harm the people whose got the names of God on their foreheads. We've just read that in chapter 9. They were only given power to torment people who didn't belong to God. Yeah? A natural locust. We're not talking about natural locusts. Demons cannot torment spirit-filled Christians. Cannot do it. They have no power over the Holy Spirit. Now remember, we're not talking about the church. We're talking about believers at this time. So... Locusts, is, is, I think this is a funny thing. God's people were allowed to eat locusts. John the Baptist, the greatest prophet who ever lived, ate locusts. He lived on locusts and wild honey. Wild honey was the promise of God. He lived on the promises of God and ate, de ate demons for breakfast. <laughs> if you read the Levitical food laws, God's people were allowed to eat locusts. Why, I mean, why even tell people that? Because they're not going to eat locusts, are they? I mean, anyone eating a locust? There's always one weirdo somewhere that's had one. <laughs> but it's throughout Scripture. You, you do not need... You can eat these things. Yeah, they can't torment God's people. I think what God's doing through this metaphor is saying, God's people do not be afraid of demons. Because some Christians get all, you have nothing to fear. You can eat them if you want. They cannot harm you. I mean, I wouldn't suggest eating a demon. I wouldn't suggest eating a, a locust. But you know where it's been, do you? But the point is, you've nothing to fear from them. They can't hurt you. They could only hurt those who belong to the evil one. They couldn't hurt those who had the name of God on their foreheads. They had no power over them. So that's another thing God shows us in the Scriptures. These locusts are not going to torment people who are genuinely belonging to God. Now, hopefully, the true overcomers in the church, well, not hopefully, the true overcomers in the church have already been taken to God at this time. But remember, there's still going to be a lot of people of, uh, who become believers or who are backsliders or uh, the tribulation saints, we call them. They have nothing to fear from this if they put their, their faith in God. They'll still suffer persecution from the devil, but not the judgment of God. Okay, so if we go down to the next one. Locusts were a sign of punishment for disobedience. God um, talks a lot about this in Deuteronomy, where he says to nations, especially to his nation, if you don't obey me, locusts are going to come on your nation. Your crops are going to fail. Your economy is going to be damaged. Everything's going to be in free fall. You're not going to be secure. You're not going to be prosperous and fruitful. Now, that is perfectly true in a natural sense. You know, if a locust swarm hits an agricultural crop or a, a, a nation that is agrarian based on an agricultural society, it will just devastate everything. Now, there's been locust swarms that have been 2,000 square miles wide. Just try and get your head around that. There's literally been swarms so big, they've, they've devastated an entire nation in like a day. It can happen. And so what we're seeing in Revelation is that punish this, um, 
these demon locusts are a punishment for nations that have been disobedient. You know, demonic activity in a nation depends on its obedience. If a nation is obedient and belongs to God and worships God, demonic activity decreases. If it, if it throws God's laws in God's face, re rejects him, demonic activity will increase. Now, we see this even in the medical field. You know, a lot of... I'm not saying they're not diseases, because there can, they can be real medical reasons for this, but how many diseases now are there that weren't even diseases? You know, psychological conditions. You know, all kinds of um, afflictions of the brain and things that... In, in previous history, we, we never even seemed to notice. It seems to be increasing. Children at school now that have these, you know, syndromes and uh, disorders that's like, where have all these come from? Well, the nation's totally disobedient, perhaps. You know, we're, we're reaping what we've been sowing. I wouldn't take that too far, because obviously there can be genuine medical uh, reasons for all this. But there's still a, a prevalence of this um, that God says will happen to a nation that rejects God's laws. You know, bad stuff will happen. Okay, let's go down to the next one. Another thing God uh, talked about of the locusts, uh, they're a picture of um, the, the people of the desert who hated Israel. Uh, the Amalekites, the Midianites. Uh, you read in the, the story of Gideon when these people came in and uh, attacked Israel and tried to take over the land of Israel and were always oppressing the people of Israel and God raised up Gideon to fight them, the, the Midianites. They're called locusts. These people come in and they're like locusts that spread themselves out over the earth. So locusts are a symbol of the enemies of God as well as symbol of all these other things. So they're a picture of uh, judgment, they're a picture of punishment, of dis coming from disobedience, they're a picture of the enemies, the nations that hate God, all backed up by these spiritual conditions. Okay, let's go to the next one. Jeremiah talks about locusts coming as a punishment for idolatry. When people worship other things rather than God, he says God is going to send an invasion of locusts. But he calls them locusts, and then he says they're an army from the north. Can you remember what we just read? Baal Zaphon? These armies from the north. Who's north of Israel? We'll look at that in a moment. The armies from the north will come like locusts. The Bible is very specific where they come from. They come from the north, north of Israel. Let's go to the next one. Now, perhaps the most famous description of locusts is found in, uh, in the prophet Joel. So let's go there. Let's go to Joel chapter 1 and verse 1. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, son of Pethuel. Hear this, you elders, listen. All you, all you who live in the land, has anything like this ever happened in your days or in the days of your ancestors? Tell it to your children and let your children tell it to their children and their children to the next generation. That's a pretty big build-up to what he's going to say, okay? You need to get ready for this. Nothing like this has ever happened before. You need to tell everybody about this, okay? A locust swarm is coming. Now, in the Hebrew, this gets a bit... Um, a bit complicated because he basically describes four types of locust. And in English, we don't really know what they are. So the interpreters do their best job at this. So uh, the great locusts, what the great locusts have eaten. And what the great locusts have left, the young locusts have eaten. And what the young locusts have left, the other locusts have eaten. They've run out of, we'll just call them other locusts. So there's this, you know, this locust swarm. Then there's the great locust, then there's the young locusts, and then there's the other locusts. Yeah, so there's four different categories of locusts here. The swarming locust, the great locust, the young locust, and the other locust. And those are very roundabout terms of to describing four types of locusts. Why, why does Joel talk about four kinds of of locusts. Now, if you look up there in verse 6, a nation has invaded my land, a mighty army is coming without number. It has the teeth of a lion and the fangs of a lioness. The locusts we have just seen in Revelation chapter 9 have teeth like a lion. Yeah? 
So Joel, remember Joel is the prophet prophesying the last days. Remember on the day of Pentecost, when Peter stood out and, and preached his sermon, he quoted Joel. In the last days, the Lord says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. He's quoting Joel chapter 2. Joel is prophesying what's going to happen in the last days. What's going to happen in these last days? These four types of locusts are going to come. They're going to invade Israel. There's a massive army coming from the north. Joel says that later on. And they're going to invade Israel. They're locusts, but they're not real locusts. They're like locusts. There's millions of them. They're a huge army. You can't count them all. They're going to devastate everything. They're going to invade. They have teeth like lion. They're extremely destructive. They're coming from the north. It's going to happen. It's one of the clearest prophecies in the Bible. This northern army that is going to come and attack Israel described as locusts. So we're getting these descriptions in Revelation on the basis that we've already read the Old Testament. So we already know what these locusts with lion's teeth are. We already know what they represent. They represent this army, this demonic horde that's coming to punish because of disobedience and idolatry that's going to come and happen. It's literally going to take place. So let's go back to Revelation. Revelation chapter 9, verse 3. So out of the smoke, locusts come down on the earth. They're given power like that of scorpions of the earth. They're told not to harm the grass or the earth or any plant. So they're not natural locusts, but they're coming to attack people. They're not allowed to kill them, but only to torture them. That's what demons do. They don't kill people. They torment people. And the agony they suffered was like that of a sting of a scorpion when it strikes. Let's just read down. During those days, people will seek death but not find it. You see, that's what a demon does. It torments you, but it doesn't want to kill you. But the demons are in control, not the person. So the person can't kill themselves. You know, the man in the tombs that we've read about, the demons killed the pigs, but the demon didn't kill the man. Why didn't they kill him? Because they enjoyed tormenting him. They had somewhere to live. So I think this is what this is referring to. I don't think it necessarily means that people can't kill themselves, although some people think it means that. If it does mean that, then there's some new technology around that, that's got, yet got to come. But I think it's more about the demon's possession of all this that's happening. It doesn't allow the people to kill themselves. It just allows them to uh, inhabit these people and torment them. Death will elude them. The locusts looked like horses prepared for battle. On their heads there were something like crowns of gold and their faces resembled human faces. Their hair was like women's hair and their teeth were like lion's teeth. Now, what does all this stuff mean? I'm not going to go into great detail looking at each one of these aspects and trying to work out what these means. Some prophecy experts, I'm not a prophecy expert, but some people who are prophecy experts try and describe um, military machinery as a description of these locusts. So they describe things like helicopter gunships or, you know, missiles, you know, cruise missiles. You know, it might look like a woman and all these imagery and... and, and metaphors and there may be something in that but I just want to stick to what the Bible says and the main thing you'll notice about all of these things that these locusts have they're a mixture of two different things that shouldn't be mixed yeah they've got crowns of gold that speaks of heaven but yet they're on earth they've like got woman's hair but then they've got male faces it's like they're neither male nor female they're neither heaven nor earth. Now, God's very clear that you don't mix things. You know, we are now in, a, in a battle now in our society where even gender distinctions are being totally blurred, so you're not allowed to say whether someone's male or female, you know, which is what this sort of thing is trying to get at. You know, they're not heaven, they're not earth, they're a mixture, they're not male, they're not female, they're a mixture, they're a bit like a horse, they're a bit like a scorpion, they're a, bit, they're a mixture of all different animals. Now if you remember what the angelic, um, the fallen angels did when they came, they mixed everything. They mixed the heavenly with the earthly, they mixed the angelic with the human, they mixed different kind of animals. And so when the angels come out, this is what they are. They're a mixture of different things. That's what the Nephilim were. 
They were a mixture. That's why God always tells us, don't mix things. Don't breed two different animals together. Don't genetically corrupt things. You'll end up with this. You'll end up with what the fallen angels. They are a mixture of different animals mixed together. Um, and so I think this is what another picture of what these locusts really are. The, they are these, these ancient spirits, these angelic fallen angels, these spirits of the Nephilim, the, the, the diamonds, the demons, the unclean spirits that are going to be released when the abyss is opened. So let's just read down. Verse 9. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the thundering of many horses and chariots rushing into battle. They're coming to make war. There's going to be a big war. They had tails with stings like scorpions, and their tails, they had power to torment people for five months. Okay, so they're out. Now, here's the interesting thing. They had as king over them the angel of the abyss, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek is Apollyon, that is the destroyer. Can we go back to chart number three, please, Luke? Okay. The Bible tells us that these demon locusts that come out of the abyss have got a king. The king of these demons, the king of this angel who's in the abyss. Now, here's an interesting thing. If you go to Proverbs 30... Verse 27. Can we just go there, please? Proverbs 30 and verse 27. Locusts have no king, yet they advance together in ranks. Okay? So the Bible explicitly states and tells us locusts haven't got a king. But then in Revelation, they have the king of the locusts, and it tells us his name. And he's the king of the abyss. He's the angel of the abyss. So, what do we make of all this? If locusts have no king, but yes, these locusts do have a king. Obviously, it's not real locusts. And, uh, you know, these locusts can now advance in ranks without a king. But now they've got a king leading them. So, it's not just an organized mess of locusts. These locusts have a very specific aim, vision, strategy, and they're being led by someone for a very specific purpose. So, who is this angel out of the abyss? Because it's not Satan. Because Satan's the angel that had fallen that opened the abyss. Yeah? This is another angel that comes out of the abyss. Now, this can sound complicated, but it's not really. Who is this angel that comes out of the abyss? Who is this person? Actually, if you know Revelation, you know who it is, because in two other places in Revelation, it tells us who the angel out of the abyss is. But I will not go there just yet. I want us to look at something else. Okay, can we go back to, back to Revelation 9, verse 11? So they had as king over them the angel of the abyss, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek is Apollyon. That is the destroyer. And then that's it. Then it goes on to the next trumpet. So it tells us that to understand his name, you have to read it in Greek and you have to read it in Hebrew. And then it gives us that understanding in Greek and Hebrew. But that doesn't help us that much because um, Abaddon Apollyon, Apollyon is Apollo in Greek, um, classical Greek, um, pantheism. Apollo was the son of God, the son of Zeus. So it's someone who claims to be the son of God, but is actually not. Okay, so he sounds like the Antichrist, doesn't he? A bit. Actually, the word uh, Apollo, um, it comes from uh, the Akkadian, or can come from the Akkadian in etymology, Aplu, which means the son of. So it's the son of God. That's what the name means, uh, Apollo, in its... I mean, Apollo did claim to be the son of God, and it means in the original Akkadian, the son of, but also in the Anatolian, Anatolian is modern-day Turkey, where uh, a lot of the Greek pantheon came from, from Babylon. But remember, they change the names all the time because the language changes. Uh, it means the hunter. 
So whilst the names can sound different, if you trace them back to the original etymological meaning, you sort of come out with the same person. Nimrod, the mighty hunter. Nimrod means we shall rebel. He's the first antichrist in the Bible. Now, when you get later on in Revelation, and it describes antichrist and this beast, it says, he once was, now is not, but yet will come. And then it says of the beast, he comes out of the abyss. Okay? So, we start to get a very, in fact, if you go to Revelation 17 and verse 8, when it gives us more information of the beast, Revelation 17 and verse 8, the beast which you saw once was, now is not, yet comes up out of the abyss and goes to its destruction. The inhabitants of the earth, whose names have not been written in the book of life from the creation of the world, will be astonished when they see the beast. Who's the beast? This angel out of the abyss. The inhabitants of the earth are going to follow him. He's not Satan. But it's Satan that controls him. Satan opens up and lets him out. Satan inhabits him. But he is a real living being in bodily form. Because this beast, they will be astonished, follow it, because it once was, now is not, and yet will come. This calls for a mind of wisdom, but we'll not go into that. So can we see, we're starting to build up a picture once again, giving us extra information of who the Antichrist is. He's the angel out of the abyss. He's Apollo. He's Nimrod. They're, all, they're, not, they're not different people. They're all the same person. They've got different names because of different languages and different systems of worship. You remember after chapter 10 in Genesis, all the languages of the world came out of Babylon. And so it all became confused. So one man now had 70 names. And in each culture, you can trace someone who claims to be the son of God, who can be worshipped by each different religion, but it's the same person. It's Nimrod. It's the one who rebels. It's the mighty hunter. It's the first world dictator. The Bible calls him also the Assyrian. He's the one who comes out of the Roman Empire. The, the prince who will come out of the people who destroyed the temple. This is who he is. We told this very clearly here in Revelation when you put all the pieces together. So he's the angel of the locusts. Okay, are you still with me? Let's go back to Amos, Amos chapter 7 and verse 1. Remember we've said Amos gives us some great understanding of what's happening in Revelation because he uses the same typology to describe the coming judgments. Okay, this is what the Sovereign Lord showed me. He was preparing swarms of locusts after the king's share had been harvested and just as the late crops were coming up. When they had stripped the land clean, I cried out, Sovereign Lord, forgive. How can Jacob survive? He is so small. Amos is seeing the same vision. But he describes it slightly differently. He says, I see the Lord preparing this swarm of locusts. What we've just read in Revelation chapter 9. God is going to release this swarm of locusts by letting um, the, the fallen star Lucifer open the pit. Okay, I see the swarm of locusts. Notice what he says though. After the king's share had been harvested. After the rapture. After that which belonged to the king had been taken from the earth, then God prepares a swarm of locusts to come and destroy everything else. Can you see that there in Amos? So Amos sees the locusts coming, but he says it's after the king's share has been harvested. Remember, Jesus is the first fruits of the harvest, but then the real harvest came at Pentecost where the Holy Spirit came and inhabited the church. The true harvest is the rapture, where God takes from the earth, the king's share, that which belongs to the king. Then, when people think there's another harvest coming, no, locusts are coming. And they're going to decimate the earth. And even Amos says, Sovereign Lord, stop. Israel won't survive. 
Even Amos in his vision says, Israel's finished. But what does God say? It will not happen. Don't worry. I've got it all in hand. He sees it to be so horrendous. He says, these, these swarm of locusts is going to wipe out Israel. God says, no, it won't. But that's what the earth will think is going to happen. Because these locusts are a very real army that is being prepared, demonically inspired. It hasn't happened yet, but it is going to happen. And it's going to be a huge battle. There's going to be a war. Now, what have we just read there in Revelation chapter 9 and verse 11? We're told the name of the king of the locusts. Yeah? But we're told he's Apollyon and Abaddon. He, he, he claims to be the son of God. The one who claims to be the son of God. He's a picture of Nimrod. He's this, he's this hunter. He's this man who rebels against God, who claims he is the true God on earth, and people have to swarm allegiance to him. But it tells us a strange thing. It says you have to read his name in Hebrew, and you have to read his name in Greek. It's strange when the Bible tells you to do that. Because it usually just says you find the original meaning in Hebrew. Why do you need to know it in Greek? If, it's, if you've got the Hebrew understanding, you don't need the Greek understanding because Greek supersedes Hebrew. It com, uh, it com, uh, Hebrew comes before Greek. Greek is the translation of the Hebrew in the Scriptures. Now, you've got to understand that the people reading the book of Revelation at that time, in fact, even in the time of Jesus, there were two Bibles, two Old Testaments. Now, they were the same Old Testament, but there was the Hebrew Old Testament, the official Hebrew scrolls that they would read in the synagogue. But most Jews didn't read Hebrew. They spoke Greek. And so what happened is the authorities, the, the leading rabbis and the, the, the Greek rulers, they translated the Hebrew scriptures into Greek. And the, uh, and the Hebrew scriptures in Greek are called the Septuagint, meaning 70, okay? Because it was 70 scholars that got together and wrote this. So there's two Bibles, one in Hebrew, one in Greek. Now, whilst they're the same, any translator or linguist will tell you that you can never say exactly in one language what you say in another language. There's no such thing. You have as close as you can. That's why we have different translations. Unless you're going to read the original language, you'll not know exactly what it says. Now, English people are not very good at this because we're lazy and we only learn one language. But if you know people who speak different languages, they'll tell you, well, it, it sort of means this. But you can't exactly find an English word for some Hebrew words or even Greek words. You have to come to the clearest uh, translation that you can. So... Can you see that verse there in chapter 1? Verse 1. This is what the Sovereign Lord showed me. He was preparing swarms of locusts after the king's share had been harvested just as the late crops were coming up. Okay? That's taken from the Hebrew text. Masoretic text. The, the original Hebrew passed down the Hebrew text. Now, for some very strange reason... The Septuagint, the Greek version, translates that slightly differently. Still says the same thing, but it, it, it adds something that's not there. Now, if you put back up the chart, Luke, I think I've put it on the chart. If you put up chart number three again. Amos 7.1 in the Septuagint says this. Thus the Lord showed me, and behold, a swarm of locusts coming early, and behold, one locust, Gog, the king. The king of the locusts is called Gog in the Septuagint. Now we know who Gog is because he's mentioned in the Bible. Now scholars have known about this for a long time, and that's why some translations try and put this in as a footnote, because it's not in the Hebrew, but it is in the Septuagint, so that the Hebrew scholars of the day felt this was the correct translation. So who's Gog? Because we've heard his Apollyon, he's the one who claims to be the son of God. He's a picture of Nimrod, the mighty hunter. But who's Gog? He's the king of the locusts. 
the king of these locusts that are going to come up in the last days that are going to attack Israel. Now, there's lots of names for the fallen angels. If you read around the Bible, even in the Bible, the book of Enoch calls the leader of the fallen angels Semiazza, um, and some others call him Azazel. Um, actually, Azazel is in the Bible. You know the goat, when they, uh, they need the sacrifice and they send one of the goats into the desert to be what we call the scapegoat? Yeah? Have you noticed that satanic pictures of Satan have, have a man with a goat's head? He's called Azazel. That goat in Hebrew, in the Hebrew, we, re, we call it the scapegoat, but in Hebrew it's Azazel. That goat becomes the Azazel. He's given to the demons in the desert, because demons are seen as being in the desert. And so that, that name is actually in the Hebrew. But we're told here he's called Gog. And we know who Gog is, because we are told in the Bible who Gog is. So he's not just the locust king. He's not just the king of the abyss, the leader of these angels who comes out of the pit. Uh, we told who he is, and we told who he is in Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 1. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, set your face against Gog. Who's Gog? The king of the locusts. Gog is not a place. Gog of the land of Magog. Mog, Magog, Magog is a place. Gog isn't. There's no such place as Gog. Gog is a demonic spirit. He is the leader of the angels of the abyss. He's the leader of the fallen angels. He is all these names. He's this entity that we will call the Antichrist. He is this thing that is going to attack Israel. Now, if you know your Bibles, Ezekiel 38 is about an army that's going to attack Israel in the last days. Who's leading the army? Gog. So this battle seems to come in the last days, which is what Ezekiel says it is. And this is what John tells us in Revelation. I am set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, prophesy against them. And say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I am against you, Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. Okay, let's just pause here a moment. So if we know he's the Antichrist, if we know he's got all these names, if he's the one Satan lets out and the one Satan's going to use to... Uh, to deceive all the nations, he's going to be the beast, the man of sin, the son of perdition, this angelic Nephilim type creature who's a picture of Nimrod, the original rebel. We know all these things about him and there's lots more things about him and he's got lots more names that we'll look at in chapter 13. But he's called the king of the locusts. Now we know in 1 John chapter 2, can we go there please? 1 John chapter 2 and verse 22 John tells us how we identify Antichrist. Who is the liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a person is the Antichrist, denying the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father, and who are, never a lot acknowledges the Son has the Father. Now, John mentions this several times in this epistle. He tells us very clearly who Antichrist is. He's the one who claims God does not have a Son. He's the, he, he claims God doesn't have a son and Jesus was not the son of God. We're told that is the spirit of Antichrist. Now, when we looked earlier, um, when we looked at Antichrist a little bit, we remembered that Antichrist puts his image where the temple is. Yeah? Antiochus Epiphanes, 163 BC, he... he desecrated the temple, destroyed the altar, and made people worship his own image and sacrifice the pig. We looked at how the emperors of Rome did the same thing. Hadrian did the same thing. It's a pattern that repeats itself. Everything that is of the spirit of Antichrist wants to put their image in the holy place. Where the temple should be stood, they want themselves. Now, we looked at that even today, there is what in Hebrew is the Hashikutz HaMeshemem, the, the symbol of Antichrist 
on the Temple Mount where the temple is. And on the Mosque of Omar, there is a, a scripture above the entrance to the Muslim shrine there that says, God has no son. He does not beget, neither is he begotten, which is the very definition of what Antichrist is. Okay? But the Bible tells us he wants to also put his image there. So what does he look like? Well, we're told is the locust king. Now, if you go to the Dome of the Rock, I've been pretty close, but I've not been right up to it because they put bands on it. Can we just bring out the next uh, chart, please? Number four. Okay, now, uh, along the top there in Arabic writing is that inscription that I've just read, that God has no son, which is the definition of Antichrist. Now, near the entrance, there's all marble around the entrance, but on the right-hand side, on the bit I've zoomed in on, there's a marble, it's just a piece of marble, but it looks like an image. I don't know if you can make it out on there. You can't make it out on the big one. But if not, I've zoomed in for you if you want to see a picture at the entrance where you enter under where it says the phrase of Antichrist. So if we go to the next slide, that's the image on the entrance to where the Holy of Holies was stood. And some people say it looks like a locust. Now, I wouldn't make a huge thing about this because it's just an image. You know, Antichrist is not the image, it's just an image. But when you remember the patterns that we keep seeing repeated throughout history, it seems as though the pattern's being repeated again. Okay? And some people say, what is that? Now, even the Muslims don't like it. But it's not a drawing, it's just the pattern in the marble. No one's designed that. You know, it just happens that at the one piece of marble at the side of that entrance, there's this thing that looks like a demon locust underneath the writing that says God has no son. So, for all I know, it's just a very, very weird coincidence. It could be, but it, it's a bit weird. Gog is the locust king. He's the Antichrist. He's the one who puts his image where the temple should be and says God has no son. So all the prophecies are lining up. All the definitions are lining up. Even the image of Antichrist, if that's what that is, seems to be in place. Now, I think the image of Antichrist will be more than that. I don't think that's the final one, but I think it is following the patterns. The final one, I think, will be a speaking, talking image through some form of technological process where Antichrist can communicate with us even though he's been killed. Because all the world wonders after him because he's killed, but he comes back to life and his image can talk. Perhaps that through some kind of computer program, artificial intelligence, I don't know, I don't want to speculate. We'll look at that later when we come on to more information about Antichrist. So, we've got this name of the locust king, the Antichrist, the angel that comes out from the abyss, and he is called Gog. Who is Gog? Can you put up the next chart? Remember when we just saw in Joel, Joel's prophecy, that there were four types of locusts that would come? Yeah? Now, throughout the Bible, you will find there is this continual emphasis on prophecy about four kingdoms, four empires. Even in the next trumpet, there'll be four angels that are released. Um, Daniel gave uh, several visions. The most famous uh, of his two prophetic visions was a vision of a statue that is in Daniel chapter 2 and a vision of different types of beasts or animals, which are in Daniel chapter 7. So I hope you've read those chapters and you know what I'm talking about. Daniel basically saw that there were going to be four empires that would oppress the nation of Israel. Right? It doesn't mean there were only going to be four empires in the world. Daniel's vision was only about the empires that affected Israel. That's what the vision is about. That's what God's purpose is always about. It's no good trying to look for certain things out of the Bible if it doesn't in any way affect Israel. It's not there. It's only there if in some way it connects with Israel because God uses Israel as the picture through which we see 
all revelation. So Daniel saw four empires that would come. Joel said there's four locusts going to come and attack Israel. That is exactly what happened. Four types of locusts. Four types of empires are going to come and attack Israel. So if we go down to the next line, uh, in the statue he saw a head of gold, uh, and in the animals he saw this lion, and Daniel says that was a picture of Babylon, which was around in the 6th century, uh, 7th, 6th century, and they took the Israelites into captivity. In fact, that's where Daniel is when he sees the vision. He's in Babylon, he sees the captivity, which happened in uh, 586 BC. Daniel was actually taken before that in around 610 uh, BC and God says there's going to be four different empires the first one is the head of gold or it's a picture of a lion in in Daniel chapter 7 that represents Babylon then after Babylon another nation would come in his statue it was um, the silver part of the statue which represented the chest in the animal it was the symbol of a bear that represented Persia or Media and Persia uh, where Cyrus the Great came uh, took over Babylon and allowed the Jews to come home, but still controlled everything. That happened in the 5th century, and they sent Nehemiah back to rebuild Jerusalem. So then there was the third empire that was going to come. In Daniel's vision of the statue, it was the belly part of the statue that was made out of the bronze. In his animal symbolism, it was the picture of the leopard, and this was a picture of what would conquer the Persians. The Greeks conquered the Persians, Alexander the Great, uh, 333 BC, uh, dispatched Darius, conquered the Persians, and took over Israel. And the Greek kingdom um, empire ruled the known world at that time for uh, many years and Hellenized the whole area. This is when everyone began speaking in Greek during this period. His kingdom was divided into four kings. Antiochus Epiphanes was the one who really oppressed Israel at that time. But then the Greeks were defeated by the Romans. Just before Christ was born, the Roman Empire was at its height, and in Daniel's statue, they were the legs of iron, and this beast was this complicated beast, which was a mixture of all the other beasts. And that obviously referred to the Roman Empire, which one controlled Israel at the time of Christ, first century BC, and then onwards through the, the next few centuries uh, until Rome was relocated to Constantinople in the 4th century AD. So they're the four kingdoms, four locusts, going to oppress Israel. As Joel predicted, as Daniel predicted, as the prophets declared. However, as you know, Daniel's prophecy didn't end there. So if you bring down the next line, then there will be a gap. Now that gap has been 2,000 years. And then there would be the re-emergence of this kingdom. Bring down the next line. And this in his statue was the feet of iron and clay. It was a mixture. It was a mixture of something very hard and a mixture of something very soft. Now remember what we've seen, these demon locusts. They're a mixture. Mixture of iron, actually. Breastplates. They're a mixture of different materials. Daniel says, this is going to be a really terrible beast. The prince that will come, the, the, this archon, the Greek word for like what we'd call a principality and power, this, this demonic entity would come out of this final kingdom, which would actually be from the fourth kingdom. Now, I'm summarizing what Daniel prophesied because we can't read the whole, whole book of Daniel. And this is going to rule in the final seven years, Daniel's final week. It's going to be this final locust plague. It's going to come. It's going to be a final empire. These aren't just countries. These are empires. Now, so this is what happened. Now, when did this empire sort of let its let go of its grip on Israel. Now, here's the strange thing. Does anyone know when the Roman Empire ceased? Now, I studied uh, Roman era archaeology at college, and there is no exact date. 
it just, Rome just metamorphosized into different things. Now, the Western Empire in Western Europe, that became what we call the Holy Roman Empire under a, a European ruler called Charlemagne. And all the Germanic tribes and everything was sort of ruled from Italy and the Pope. But you've got to remember that Constantine, when he became the Roman Emperor who became Christian, he, he actually moved the Roman Empire from Rome to a city that he named after himself, Constantinople, Constantinople the city of Constantine. That is in Turkey. So the Roman Empire wasn't actually in Rome by the 4th century. It was in Turkey. And when the Western Empire, when Rome was sacked by the barbarians and uh, Western Europe fell into decay, went into the Dark Ages, the, Constant, the, the, uh, the empire in Turkey became known as the Byzantine Empire ruled from Constantinople. That ruled Jerusalem for hundreds of years. That ruled the Holy Land for hundreds of years. That continued to exist for right up until, um, basically until, until the Ottoman Empire took over in Turkey. And the, Turkey became the center of the Ottoman Empire. So it's still the same sort of thing. It just became Islamic instead of, it wasn't even Christian by that time, the Byzantine had fallen into decay. And so it still controlled Jerusalem. So when did the Ottomans actually let go of Jerusalem? When did Jerusalem finally get liberated from all those empires? Anybody got any ideas? 1917 is the first time since all that, since Daniel had that prophecy, that Israel, it was actually controlled by the British, but the British gave the mandate for the Jews to return home. And when the Jews and Arabs started fighting against each other, although Britain was a, a world empire at that time, Britain didn't get a what caught in the crossfire between the Arabs and the Jews, so we walked away and let them fight amongst themselves. So after that, the Jewish nation started to, for the first time since Jesus, the 2,000 year gap, for the first time, began its own autonomous nation. So the Ottomans, the Turkish Empire, was what took over what was the Roman Empire, the Eastern Empire. It became known as the Caliphate, and it controlled that area of what was the Roman Empire during that time. Okay, are you still following me? So, when all this ended, we're still awaiting this final bit that is linked to all the other four bits. The final bit is going to be a combination of the previous four. Yeah? Now, that means it is probably geographically the same. That means it's coming from the same place, it's got the same aspects because this terrible beast is a mixture of a lion and a bear and a leopard and it comes out of something that once was the Roman Empire. And so this is going to come. Now, at the minute, it hasn't come because Israel is still an independent nation. It's going to come in the final seven years or come to power in the final seven years. Now, lots of people speculate about what this is going to be. We don't need to do that. We just focus on some aspects of it. So once that's happened, the Bible's very clear there's going to be wars coming. There's going to be lots of wars coming that affect Jerusalem. Now, a lot of people have focused on what's called the Psalm 83 war. If we can go to Psalm 83 and verse 3, Psalm 83 and verse 3, God here is telling us of a future conflict that just keeps happening. It's, it's more of an irritating conflict rather than a huge war. And uh, God says that these nations have taken crafty counsel against your people. They have consulted against your hidden ones. Who are the hidden ones? That's interesting. Anyway, they have said, come, let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance... And there's nations still saying that today. Let's wipe Israel off so they know they don't exist anymore. For they have consulted together with one consent. They are a confederate against thee. 
the tabernacles of Edom, the Ishmaelites of Moab, and the Hagarines, uh, Jebal and Ammon and Amalek, the Philistines and the inhabitants of Tyre. Ashur also is joined to them, so they have helped the children of Lot. Selah, Selah means think seriously about this. Okay, so God's saying that in the future, these nations are going to oppress and come into conflict with Israel. Now, if we can put up the next chart, please. So since Israel became a nation, have these nations we've just read in Psalm 83, have they kept continually fighting with Israel, organizing together and keep attacking Israel? Well, it depends whether you understood the ancient names. So if we look at what the ancient names were in the geographic location and give them their modern names, we can see a pattern. Edom, Moab, and Ammon are going to oppress Israel. Those three tribes are now the nation of Jordan. Has Jordan attacked Israel? Yes. Twice. 1948, 1967, and then there was the Yom Kippur War where Jordan didn't really want to get involved very much, but was dragged into it by uh, certain aspects of it. Okay, so, tick that one off. Next one. The Hagrites. You remember Hagar? Hagar was an Egyptian. Did Egypt attack Israel during that first 70 years? Yes. Nasser attacked Israel during the Six-Day War, or rather was attacked by Israel before he could attack, and then Egypt attacked in the 1973 Yom Kippur War. So, tick that one off. So this has happened. What about the next one? Ishmael, Amalek, the Arabs. Are the Arabs attacking Israel at all in the last 70 years? Just a bit. So that one's happened. Okay, what about the next one? Uh, the Phoenicians, Tyre, what we will call modern-day Lebanon. Has Lebanon attacked Israel recently? Hey, it's been firing rockets all the time. Lebanon attacked Israel all the way through the last 70 years. And Hezbollah in Lebanon claim now they have so many rockets there on the Lebanese border, they can cause massive destruction to Israel, and they're just waiting to attack at any time. So tick that one off. That's already happened. What about the Palestinians? Do they fire rockets at Israel and attack Israel? Has that happened? The Philistine, you know, Gaza is where the Philistines were. Has that one happened? Yes, that happens every day. So we can take that one off. So you would think that Psalm 83 has sort of already been fulfilled. Yeah? Is there any more? Assyria, which is Syria-Iraq. Did Syria-Iraq attack Israel? Absolutely. I don't know if you remember the first Gulf War where Saddam Hussein launched his Scud missiles from Iraq at Israel, and Syria's always been attacking Israel uh, ever since the beginning, Six-Day War, uh, 73 Yom Kippur War, where they came back over the Golan Heights. So, yes, that's happened in Israel's uh, last 70 years since the Ottoman Empire uh, finished. So, that's sort of fulfilled, isn't it? Still happening, but this conflict that was described there in Psalm 83 seems to uh, sort of already be happening. So if you look at the chart, you see little Israel there in sort of the, uh, the middle upper, upper left, uh, surrounded by those nations, Syria, Iraq, Jordan, Egypt, the Arab nations, Lebanon. They have all attacked Israel. They're all the immediate neighbors of Israel, Jordan as well. So, but they're not... They're not a big empire. Remember what the prophecies we've seen of the locusts are. They're, that's a big empire. That's an entire horde of nations with huge militaries. None of those nations have got huge militaries that we've just mentioned. Syria hasn't, Iraq hasn't, Jordan hasn't, Egypt hasn't, Saudi Arabia hasn't, Lebanon hasn't. None of those nations, if they attacked Israel, would win just on a, on a military strategy uh, Assessment: Israel will just will wipe the floor with them because Israel's uh, military is far superior to any of theirs. That's why they won't attack them anymore. But that's not what the prophecies were of Gog's army. That's not what the prophecies were of the locust army. That's not what the prophecies were that we've seen there in Revelation. No, this is a huge amalgamation 
of huge countries with huge armies attacking like a swarm. So Psalm 83 has been fulfilled, but there is another war. There's not just the four empires that have happened in history. There's not just this. The Bible puts most emphasis on this other war, this other war that is coming that we call the Ezekiel 38 and 39 war, the war led by Gog, the king of the locusts. The angel that comes out of the abyss. So if we go to Ezekiel chapter 38 and verse 1. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against them. And say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. By the way, if you have a, an NIV footnotes, it actually inserts another nation in there. Uh, where it says the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, it says the prince of Rosh. Um, because you can translate it either way in the Hebrew, chief prince or prince of Rosh. Rosh is a country. Um, and, and some translations put that in. This one we have here hasn't put that in. S uh, the New King James Version does put that in. And so you've got a list of nations here that are going to attack Israel. Now, we can't read all chapter 38 and all chapter 39. Hopefully you've read it. This is called the, the War of Gog and Magog. It's perhaps the most famous war in the Bible. Some people call it World War III. Because when you look at who these nations are, you will start to understand this is going to be a big fight. Because these are, some of these are superpowers. And so, Ezekiel 38 it comes after Ezekiel 37, which you probably figured out. Ezekiel 37 is the Valley of Dry Bones, where Israel is regathered as a nation and put back in its own land. So Israel is regathered as a nation before this, put back in its own land. Then you get Ezekiel 38 and 39, and then Ezekiel chapter 40 is the Millennial Kingdom. Where, the, where everything is renewed and the new temple and Jesus, the prince, comes and inhabits. So Ezekiel 38 and 39 happens somewhere between Israel becoming a nation again and Jesus coming back. Sometime. Now, we've had 70 years now of that sometime, 70 years uh, this month of Israel being a nation again. So we are on the precipice of this battle starting to take place, this war. We should be able to see the beginnings of this starting to take place. Now, here's the strange thing. None of these nations listed here are, have ever had an alliance together or have ever worked together. Never. They've not been friendly as such. They, they've not worked together. They've certainly never had a military alliance. None of these nations mentioned here have ever had that. It's something that was going to happen in future. When Ezekiel said that, it didn't make any sense. If we look at what these nations are, we will start to see some very startling things. Remember, these are the nations that Gog is going to use to attack Israel, to start this battle, sometimes called the Battle of Armageddon, World War III. Gog is going to use these nations because he's the prince behind it, behind these nations that attacks Israel. So if we go to chart number 9, so Ezekiel 38, if we look at who these nations are in our modern language, now, some people say you can't totally identify all of these nations, which is sort of true to a point. But actually, if you read ancient writers, uh, people like Josephus, who wrote something called The Antiquities of the Jews, he actually went through writing a history of the Jewish nation. And when, when it talks about all the ancient na nations mentioned in Genesis, Josephus told us 
what those ancient names and he gave them their modern meaning or their meaning at that time. There's also a historian called Herodotus called the father of history. And he wrote, even before the time of Christ, a history of the world, and he described the names of the nations in antiquity, and he gave them names that we understand or that we can trace back. So I argue that you can more or less prove who these nations are. Maybe not the exact borders, but the general geographic area of modern nations, if you look at the ancient writers. Okay, so let's look at the first one. Rosh, Russia. Okay. Now, some people say, it's well, it might not be Russia. Well, it's that sort of area, that uh, southern Russian steppe area, that kind of region. Okay, some people link it with uh, lots of different tribes, but... Most conservative scholars say possibly Russia, that one. Okay, next one. Magog, the southern Russian steppe area, sometimes, you know, those states that broke away after the Soviet Union, the Stan areas, yeah, you know what I'm talking about? Um, that sort of area, southern Russian region, Caspian Sea type area. Okay, next one. Meshach Tubal Togoma, Turkey. No one really disagrees with that. Okay, it's Turkey. It's regions that were in Turkey. It's now part of Turkey. Next one. Persia. That's the easy one because Iran was called Persia even in the lifetime of some of you here. Didn't change its name until the uh, 1939. I think they changed it to Iran, but it was always called Persia. We know that one. No one disagrees with that one anyway. Uh, it's Persia. Next one. Kush is Sudan, the upper Nile region of what was southern, you know, deep southern Egypt, where the Nile came from, uh, going into Ethiopia as well. Sudan, next one. Put is Libya, the nation, what we would say is west of Egypt. Is there another? Goma. Goma. Uh, not exactly sure, some people argue about it, uh, area of Russia, stroke Turkey, these areas, uh, Cappadocia, Galatia, Phrygia in the New Testament, Turkey, uh, up towards the Russian border there. Now, have you noticed something about those nations? Remember when Ezekiel said this, those nations had nothing to do with each other. In fact, they were more likely to just be antagonistic towards each other. Uh, those nations weren't even one nation, you know, Meshach, Tubal, Togoma, these places, Goma, they weren't even one nation. Today they are the nation of Turkey. It's all one nation. Turkey actually links Europe with Babylon, if you look on a map. It's like a bridge going to Iraq, Iran, right over to Greece. It's a, it's a very strategic nation. All these nations sort of border Turkey. So, you will notice a very striking pattern there, predicted nearly 3,000 years ago, of which nations Gog is going to use to bring about this battle. Now what's startling about these nations is they're planning to battle right now. Now there was a meeting last week between the Ayatollah of Iran, the President Putin of Russia, and Erdogan of Turkey. They met together in secret, those three nations. We don't know what they were discussing. Now, if you read Ezekiel's prophecy, it says these three nations will meet together and devise a plan to invade the nation of Israel. Now, you don't need anyone to tell you that Iran wants to wipe Israel off the map and Erdogan hates Israel. And Putin will do whatever is good for Putin. Now, Libya has fallen at the moment, is in a real mess, and it is becoming the center for ISIS. I don't know if you remember, just a short time ago, they marched all those Christians. Beheaded them. That was in Libya, becoming a center for ISIS. ISIS are mobilizing on the borders of Israel. They have cells there now. 
Last week, the Israelis bombed an Iranian position on the borders of their land, took out 12 um, Republican guards of Iranians. They shouldn't even be there. They claim they're not there, but Israel knows they're there. Turkey's there, sent its tanks into northern Syria recently. Russia's there, and last week, the USA, Britain, and France bombed Damascus, took out these military uh, Assad's um, chemical warfare factory, but the Russians are there as well. Now, what's interesting is Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 17, verse 1, that one day in the final days, Damascus is going to be obliterated and will never be a city again. That has never been fulfilled in history. Damascus is the most continually inhabited city in the world, the most ancient city in the world, probably along with Jericho. Sudan is uh, extremely militant Islamic as well. So all the pieces are coming together. It's the only time in history it's ever happened. And they are mobilizing in the north. Remember all the prophecies, it will come from the north. Come from the north into the northern mountains of Israel. So Ezekiel's prophecy seems to be taking shape. Now, when does this battle happen? Well, in Revelation, it, it, there's three different parts to it. There seems to be a battle that happens here right at the beginning of this tribulation period. There seems to be the battle that we call the Battle of Armageddon, um, some other point during it, and then there seems to be a battle right at the end uh, Gog and Magog fighting against the forces of God uh, much later, uh, after the millennium period. Now, which one of those is true? Well, I presume they're all true um, because prophecy is a pattern. But the first of these battles, if we go to uh, Ezekiel 38 and verse 7, also Goma with its troops and Beth Togomar from the far north with all its troops and many nations with them. Get ready, be prepared. You and all the hordes gathered about you and take command of them. Remember, God's talking to Gog. He's saying, listen, Gog, this is what you're going to do. Go on, get on with it. Get ready, be prepared. You and all the hordes gathered about you, take command of them. Go down a couple more verses. After many days, some versions say in the latter days, in the last days, you will be called to arms in the future years, okay? Future years when? After Israel becomes a nation, because this is Ezekiel 38, became a nation in 30, uh, Ezekiel chapter 37, they gathered together. In the future years, you will invade this land, which is recovered from war. Israel today is a land that has been recovered from 70 years of conflict. It's incredible how prosperous it is, considering the conflict and antagonism and warfare it's had in 70 years. It's relatively at peace now, as, you know, as peaceful as, as, as any, well, more peaceful than any of the nations around it. Whose people were gathered from many nations. Is that Israel? Yes, they've been gathered from many nations. Back to the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate. 2,000 years of desolation, but they're going to be regathered. They're regathered, then what's going to happen? These nations are going to mobilize in the north. They're going to get ready to attack Israel. They have been brought out from the nations. Now all of them are living in safety. He's talking to Gog. You and all your troops and the many nations with you, you will go up, advancing like a storm. You will be like a cloud covering the land. This is exactly what we see in Revelation chapter 9. Gog, the king of the locusts, mobilizing an army ready to attack God's people. Okay, so this is in place tonight, more or less. Now, does that mean this battle is going to happen imminently? Well, it could. It doesn't necessarily mean that. Obviously, this could go on for years before this finally takes place. I have no way of knowing, none of us do, but we do know that for the first time in history, the nations talked about here are already in place for the first time in history. And they hate Israel, and they're getting ready to attack, and they've been scheming together to put some kind of plan into operation. So if you go to um, 
verse 10. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. On that day, the thoughts will come into your mind. You will devise an evil scheme. You will say, I will invade a land of unwalled villages. I will attack a peaceful and unsuspecting people. All of them living without walls and without gates and bars. I will plunder and loot and turn my hand against the resettled ruins. It was a nation that was desolate. Now it's been resettled. They're going to invade it. And the people gathered from the nations, rich in livestock and goods, living at the center of the land. So all these nations are coming. It tells us there's going to be other nations with them, other nations joining in this. And if you go to verse 13, it says an interesting thing. Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish and all her villages or cities will say to you, have you come to plunder? Have you gathered your hordes to loot, to carry off silver and gold, to take away the livestock and goods and to seize much plunder? If you go into the King James there for verse 13, it gives us a slightly different way of reading it. Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish and all the young lions thereof shall say unto you. So there are four other nations that object to these nations invading Israel. Right? Now Sheba and Dedan is basically Saudi Arabia. I don't know if you know Saudi Arabia's policy. They want to be friendly with Israel. They don't want to attack Israel anymore. And then this country called Tashish, which no one really knows what it is. There are two theories. It's Western Europe or it's Great Britain. And the reason is Tashish, the word, comes from a, a place of smelting, and the place you smelt it in was Cornwall in Great Britain at that time. And the ships of Tarshish, if you study it in the Bible, it took them three years to get there and back. And Britain was the furthest known uh, coastland island place at that time. So if that is true, it's certainly Western Europe if it's not Britain. The Western Europe objects to this, um, these armies and these nations invading Israel. Uh, but it doesn't say they do anything about it. They just object to it which is exactly what's happening now. And not just Tarshish, it says that phrase with, with the young lions. And some theologians speculate, well, if Tarshish is Britain, who are the young lions? Because Britain is known as the lion, you know, it's, a, it's, our, it's our emblem, the British lion. So the young lions are the colonies that Britain planted, the, the younger Britain, so the United States. So some people speculate the Brit, you know, the Western nations, the United States, and other British colonies like I suppose Australia, New Zealand, Canada, those type of nations object. Tashish and the young, they're saying you're not doing that, but they do it anyway. And what might happen from that is World War Three. Um, we have to put other scriptures together and follow Ezekiel's pattern to find out exactly what happens. So therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to Gog, remember he's talking to Gog, he's talking to the demonic spirit behind these nations. He's not talking to Putin or Erdogan, he's talking to the demon behind it, this prince of the locusts. Thus saith the Lord God, in that day when my people, Israel, dwells in safety, Shall you not know it? He, you see, he knows what God's plan is. That's been your plan all along, to destroy Israel. I know what you're doing. Go down to the next verse. Let's go to the NIV again. It's a bit easier to read in the NIV. You will come from your place in the far north. What is the far north from Israel? Turkey, Russia. Yeah? Then it's the North Pole. You and many nations with you, all of them riding on horses. The, the word for horses in Hebrew is leapers. It, can, it could be the same word for a vehicle, actually. A great horde, a mighty army. You will advance against my people, Israel, like a cloud that covers the land. In the days to come, Gog, I will bring you against my land so that the nations may know me when I am proved holy through you before their eyes. Let's go down a couple more. 
I'm not going to read the whole two chapters. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. You are the one I spoke of in former days. My servants, the prophets of Israel. So he's saying, this is the guy. This is the battle that all the prophets were talking about. This is it. Gog, these nations. Servants, the prophets of Israel. At that time, they prophesied for years that I would bring you against them. Isn't that what people say? Oh, people have been prophesying this for years. It's never going to happen. Uh, it is going to happen. This is what will happen on that day when Gog attacks the land of Israel. My hot anger will be aroused, declares the Sovereign Lord. In my zeal and my fiery wrath, I declare that at that time there will be a great earthquake in the land of Israel. The fish in the seas, the birds of the sky, the beasts of the field, every creature that moves along the ground, and all the people on the face of the earth will tremble at my presence. The mountains will be overturned, the cliffs will crumble, and every wall will fall to the ground. I will summon a sword against Gog on all the mountains, declares the Sovereign Lord. Every man's sword will be against his brother. These nations will enter just as there's this cosmic calamity. This is where we say there's the overlaps in Revelation. We've seen the cosmic calamities. This war could be happening at the same time as these cosmic calamities all kick in. Verse 22. Just read two more verses. I will execute judgment on him and plague and bloodshed. I will pour down torrents of rain, hailstones and burning sulfur on him and on his troops and on the many nations with him. And so I will show my greatness and my holiness and will make myself known in the sight of many nations. Then they will know that I am. Am the Lord. In that day, God says, these locusts, these armies, this Gog, these nations will invade Israel. But they don't get in. But why don't they get in? You see, whilst we can say, Amen, God spares his nation Israel. If you actually go to the next chapter, 39 verse 4, it describes what's actually happening in this conflict. So if you go to Ezekiel 13, you remember whole two chapters is describing this battle. On the mountains of Israel you will fall. So this, this, this army is destroyed. And if you read the whole chapter, it's through lit, literally liquid fire, uh, sulfur burning the whole armies to a crisp. On the mountains of Israel you will fall, you and all your troops and all the nations with you. I will give you as food to all kinds of carrion birds and to the wild animals. You will fall on the open field, for I have spoken, disguise the sovereign Lord. I will send the fire on Magog, Magog and on those who live in safety in the far coastlands. It's not just the armies of the north that are obliterated. It's the islands to the west that are obliterated as well. This is why some people think this is World War III. I will send fire on Magog. We know the Magogian armies and Gog and all the nations are destroyed, but also on those who live in safety in the coastlands. The coastlands are the Western nations. So is there a nuclear exchange? Because all the nations are destroyed. Except Israel and some other nations around. Then they will know that I am the Lord. This is why we can't be complacent. Because our nation deserves judgment just as, much as, just as much as Russia and Turkey and Iran. In fact, we're doing things they wouldn't dream of doing. And so, in that day, in that day, they keep saying that, in that day, this future day, when all this comes together, when you're seeing all this come together, you know that the time is near. Now, when does it actually happen? If you go to 39 and verse 9... Now, as I've said, there are different battles throughout the process of Revelation. Some people think the final battle of Gog and Magog is right at the end of Revelation, and there is a battle of Gog and Magog at the end of Revelation, because Gog is a spirit, so he, he fights again at the end, when he's let back out of the abyss after the millennium. But it says here that after this battle... Those who live in the towns of Israel will go out and use the weapons for fuel, burn them up. Now, if there's nuclear equipment, they can use that as literally as fuel. And you think of all the weapons and equipment there, it will give them fuel to use if they can, uh, you know, collect all that. 
fuel and burn them up, the small and the large shields, the bows, the arrows, the wall clubs, the spears, and for seven years they will use them as fuel. So a lot of people think this has to happen before the seven-year tribulation because there's seven years after it. And it doesn't seem to make sense if that was in the millennium because God wouldn't list seven years in the millennium. It's a peaceful thousand years. They won't be dealing with weaponry. So most commentators think this war happens before, or the start of this war happens before the seven-year tribulation period. Some people think it happens after the rapture. Some people think it happens before the rapture. Some people think it happens at exactly the same time as the rapture. Um, I'm not 100% either way, but I, I know it is happening. It is going to happen, and it is going to come just as God has prophesied. And so, Gog, the leader of these demonic hordes, is, is going to be behind it ultimately now. He hasn't been released yet. But remember the, the stages of things in Revelation. They can all happen very quickly. You know, we've been looking at all the trumpets and all the seals. There's nothing to say all those things can't happen in the same week. You know, don't think, oh, they're all spread over a seven-year period. No, not necessarily. The Bible doesn't say that at all. It just says they come consequentially. Uh, it doesn't mean uh, consecutively, sorry. It doesn't mean that they can't come very quickly. So we've got all these prophecies that are going to happen. Zechariah talks about the same battle. In Zechariah 14, verse 12, and I think we'll wrap it up with this. Zechariah uh, 14, verse 12. You see, this is the battle. They come into Israel. They want to capture Jerusalem. Zechariah says, This is the plague which the Lord will strike all the nations that come and fight against Jerusalem. Their flesh will rot while they are still standing on their feet. Their eyes will rot in their sockets. Their tongues will rot in their mouths. On that day, people will be stricken by the Lord with great panic. They will seize each other by the hand and attack each other. So when you put it all together, all the chapters in Ezekiel and all the other prophets, it seems to describe some kind of warfare that has only been possible in our time. Because entire armies literally just melt as they're still stood on their feet from liquid sulfur burning in the atmosphere that just vaporizes them all. And in Revelation it gives us more details of that. We'll look at that later at some, uh, at some other time. So this is all coming together. And the, 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 the main player in this battle seems to be this Meshach and Tubal, Togomar, this place that we call Turkey. Now, I know we've looked at this before, but there's something very, very prophetically important about Turkey. Remember, it was Turkey that was the Ottoman Empire that was the last empire to control Israel. It was part of the Roman Empire. It was actually one of the centers of the Roman Empire. The seven churches in Asia were all in Turkey. The caliphate to control the region was Islamic Turkey. The seat of Satan in Revelation is in Turkey. There is too much coincidental information for us to come to the conclusion that Turkey is not essential for the fulfillment of this plan. And if you've been following the recent... Um, political scenario in in Turkey. Erdogan has now taken over. It's now a dictatorship. It's not a democracy anymore. Uh, he's threatening Israel increasingly, and he wants to set up a caliphate, an Islamic empire once more, controlling that part of the Mediterranean area. And it's uh, based on fundamentalist Islam. That's what's happening. I know I showed you this picture before. If you can just put up the final chart... You know, even the, the symbol of Turkey is the ancient symbol of Baal, the, the crescent and the star. That's a coin. I don't think you can see it very well, you know, of the, the bull. You remember the children of Israel danced around the bull because it was a symbol of Baal, that crescent and star, the symbol of God's enemy, which is the symbol of Turkey's flag. It's a symbol of other flags as well. Could be a coincidence. I don't know. It's a very strange emblem to have the symbol of antichrist as your national flag so turkey is going to be increasingly active in these coming days and months what do we do 
we look to Jesus. We look to Jesus because the Bible tells us when we see these things happening, lift up your heads, Jesus says, your redemption draws nigh. When you see these things happening, when you see the nations starting to surround Jerusalem, when you see the enemies of God all coming together, mobilizing together to attack Israel, Jesus says, lift up your heads, your redemption is coming. You know it's time. So I think I'll give you enough information there to be pondering on. We'll look at the, uh, the second war next time. Amen. God bless you all.